My name is Pastor Sam Velez. I'm the executive pastor here at Iglesia Cristiana Misericordia. God has a specific word for you. Open up your heart and get ready to receive. All gas, no brakes. For if you're new here, or maybe you, you know me, but you don't know me that well, I am a huge, I'm a sports fan, all right? I love all things sports. I've told our youth and young adults for many years that if I was not pastoring, I would probably be working for ESPN or something in the sports world. I love football, basketball, I'll do baseball, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll do it all because I love sports. In fact, when I was in college, I started off as a sports management major because I wanted to be an agent one day. I wanted to do that and I had this opportunity uh, back in the day to do an internship with the Texas Rangers for baseball and um, I ended up not doing that. The Lord wanted me to do something else, but I, I, I love, I love sports and when I was going to do the internship for the Rangers, that was like back in the day when they were actually at the World Series, like back to back, and they broke our hearts. You know, it, it's, it's a journey. It's, a, it's been a journey for me. But, but the reason why we use this, 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 this theme, all gas, no brakes, is because we got this from the, the University of Texas hired a football coach. His name is Steve Sarkeesian, and he is the new football coach for the University of Texas, aka UT. If you're an Aggies fan, hold your comments, all right? But UT, and this, when he first got hired, one of the first things he brought up was this theme, all gas, no brakes. And what he was trying to say is that as a team, as a unit, we're not going to stop for anyone or anything. It's all gas, no brakes. If you love cars, that sounds, it's like music to your ears, all right? Racing, all right? All gas, no brakes. And um, the reason why I, I brought this up is because I, I love, you know, UT. I've been to UT games. It's one of the greatest things ever. But I love this thing because it also applies to our personal lives. That God has called me and you to be all gas, no brakes in our relationship with him. That we're not going to stop for other people. That we're not going to stop for any other thing. That we're going to stay true to what God has called us to be. That our relationship with God wouldn't stop at every speed bump. That our relationship with God wouldn't change at every problem. That we would have a perseverance in our spirit to continue to follow God through every kind of season that we're in. Because here's the thing. Life throws obstacles all the time. Life comes with its baggage. Life comes with its problems. And when those things present themselves in our lives, it's easy for me and for you to press the brake and say, you know what, I'm going to stop. You know what, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably just, I'm, I'm going to take a break from you, God. You know what, God, maybe I should, I'm not going to pray or maybe I'm not going to have faith anymore. Maybe I'm not going to try anymore. Or maybe I'm not going to try to change this about myself. I'm just going to put, I'm going to pump the brakes. And the reality is, is that Jesus doesn't want us to pump the brakes with him. Jesus wants it all. For all the young people, he wants all the smoke, all right? He wants it all. And if you have your Bibles, you're going to understand why I called this. I want you to go to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 6 through 15. Colossians, chapter 2, 6 through 15. This is Paul talking, and he writes to the church, and he says this. It says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue. If you have your Bible, underline that, highlight that. It's, it's, it's a big deal in this passage. You must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are, com so you are also complete through your union with Christ, who is head over every ruler and authority." 
when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Can we God an amen that he did this on the cross for me and for you? Paul is a living testament of what the power of God can do in someone's life. If you're new here, Paul was not the greatest Christian on the planet. In fact, Paul was the opposite. Paul would come and try to arrest Christians because he thought that they were creating this cult that was destroying the Jewish people. Paul was a different kind of man, but then he has an encounter with Jesus himself and his life is forever transformed. And so now we can get the feeling, we can see Paul and his writing talk about the excitement that comes with having a new life in Jesus. See, in this time, in the book of Colossians, the, the whole theme of Colossians, if you don't know this, is Paul is trying to remind them that Christ is supreme. That Christ is supreme. That Christ reigns over everything. That Christ is the final authority. He's trying, that is the whole theme of Colossians. And so when Paul is writing this, he's talking to a people that have experienced Jesus, like me and you. They've experienced a new life. They've experienced what the power of God can do. This is already past the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit has already come. The churches are spreading like wildfire. And now they're in this point. The reason why Paul is writing what he's writing is because although they've experienced everything that Jesus has to offer, they get stuck. They're starting to battle with other people because now they're starting to deal with the philosophies of this world and the human teaching, the people that are trying to disregard who Jesus is and trying to make them question. And now they're kind of like at a roadblock. And it's kind of like me and you. We have this relationship with Jesus. We love God and we want to be here. But then things come our way that sometimes distract us and put the brakes in our life. And then we begin to question God all the time. We ask God, why? Why does this? And we, we begin to fall away. And before you know it, we stop coming to church. We stop praying. We stop reading the Bible. And, and the reality is, like Paul said, we must continue to follow him. Through it all. Through it all. Because you know what? We're dealing with the same things. There are so many ideologies. There are professors that want to make you question God. It, you, don't have to go, you don't have to leave Laredo to find professors like that. You can find them anywhere that are there because they have no relationship with God. And so they're trying, like the, like the, pe like the philosophers of those days and the teachers of those days, they're trying to get you to stray away from the truth of who God is. And when we stray away from the truth of who God is, we begin to stray away from his blessings, his peace. We begin to stray away from our identity in him. And Paul is writing because he's like, hey, it's all gas, no brakes. Don't stop. He's telling him, continue. That's why I told you to underline or highlight. He's telling him, continue to follow him despite what you're hearing, despite what you're reading, despite all of that, continue to follow him. Yeah, continue to follow him. And so I wanted, I wanted to talk about this today because as we get ready on this journey with Easter, we have to understand tomorrow, today, we still have the news talking to us. We still have people talking all over the world. We still have a life. We still have jobs. We still have things we have to face. We still have it all. And it is our responsibility to persevere through it. So we got to go forward. 
We got to continue to move forward. We can't look behind anymore. When God came into your life, it transformed you. You're no longer who you used to be. You don't, you, you don't think the way you used to think. You don't talk the way you used to talk because now God has given you a new life, a future that's abundant and fruitful. It's not for me and you to look at God, but also look at the back. We're, we're constantly like this. It's not like that. It's us looking forward to our future. And so our responsibility is to go forward with Jesus. And we do that by what we believe. By what we believe. If we're going to go forward, what we believe is the most important thing about us. What we believe is the most important thing about me and you. I'll never forget, I was watching this movie and this, this, this quote started. You know, this quote stuck with me out of this movie a long time ago. If you're taking notes, just to let you know, it's called What We Believe. If we're going to, we have to talk about what we believe. They'll put it up there in a moment. And um, I was watching this movie a long time ago and this quote stuck with me. And the crazy thing about this quote is it wasn't even a Christian man that said it, but he said this. He said, religion separates people, but belief brings them together. Yeah. He said, religion separates people, but belief brings them together. And isn't it so true that when you gather with people that believe in the same thing as you, it, it, it continues to grow. There, there's, no, there's no division. There's unity. We see this in sports. When you are part of a team, you understand, you believe the same thing, that you can win. A few years ago, a long years ago, USA had a chant in the World Cup, I believe that we will win. And it was a, a famous chant. There might not be the greatest soccer team in the world, but that chant during that time was better than all the other ones. I believe we will win. Because there's something that happens when me and you come together and we believe for the same thing. We see this in politics. We see this in conversations and friendships and relation. Me and you, we, 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 we come together by belief. We're here together because we believe in Jesus. But here's the thing. If we're not careful with what we believe in, we will fall for everything. And we will fall for every lie any truth that comes against the word of God. And before you know it, we no longer carry the same belief. We no longer believe in the truth about Jesus. In, flat, in fact, we come against the truth of Jesus. And so if we're going to go forward with Jesus, we have to understand that we must learn what we believe. We have to trust that the truth of God stands firm in our life. Because the truth of God has stood the test of time. Thousands and thousands of years, the word of God has been preached, talk about written, and it has not changed. If you were to go to Israel and you were to find out the facts about the Bible, you will see that nothing has changed. The only thing that's changed, obviously, is languages, because none of us speak Hebrew or Greek. That's the only thing, is the languages. But it's the same story, the same writers, the same truth that has tested time and time again. And Paul, when he talks about belief and he talks about the truth, he, he goes, and let me just go back to 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7, just to give you something. He says, now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down deep into him and let your lives be built on him. On him, Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you are taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Paul uses two metaphors. It's funny. Two metaphors and the same thing. He talks about roots and he talks about a foundation. He says, hey, you got to build your roots deep enough because the roots that you're building in is in, it's the truth of God's love in Christ. And then he says, you got to build a foundation because that's on the solid rock. It sounds kind of familiar because... Years and years before that, Jesus talked about soil, and he did talk about foundation. Jesus said, he talked about soil. He said, he talked about seeds falling in different ground, grounds and different soils. He talked about there are people that will hear the word of God. They'll get excited, but because they don't got roots deep enough, they fall away. They fade away. They stop coming. And then he also talks about a man that builds his house on a rock and in sand. The same thing. The truth of God. Both of them are talking about the same thing and it's a deeper relationship with God over a shallow one. The same thing. He said, you got to get your roots 
dig, you got to dig them deep and down in your soul that no matter what happens around you, God's truth remains and faith is produced and holiness is produced and, and fear has to leave and other things have to die because God, you got some roots deep down and God is changing you. And it's the same thing with a house, house built on the rock. The rock is the word of God. The rock is Jesus. It's the truth that no matter what storm has come, you're not built on sand. You're built on rock. And so Paul's trying to get the people to understand, hey, you got to go deeper with Jesus. You've been on the shallow side of the pool for a long, long time. And that's why you keep going back and forth with what's happening around you. I don't know if you ever took swimming lessons. When I remember when I was taking swimming lessons, I used to take swimming lessons back in the day. Um, I, I think it's still there. There's like a, I guess, Olympic sized pool where United Middle is. And um, I used to take, my parents used to take me lessons there to learn how to swim. And I, you know how it is. You, you start small and then before you know it, you start going to the deep. I remember, I'll never forget, we celebrated, I think at Pizza Hut, that the day that I was able to go down to the deep and grab something and go back up. It was like a, like, I don't know why we celebrated at Pizza Hut, but it was a triumph in my life. I was able to go to the deep. I was able to swim. I was able to touch the bottom of the floor. And I was obsessed with it. Like, oh, I can do this now. You know, I can touch the deep. You know, I can go back up. And then it was, a pro it was progressive. I started off in the shallow. And then I remember, I think it was like, man, either nine feet or I don't know how feet. Back then, pools were deep, you know. Nowadays, people's pools are like six feet or five feet max all over. But back then, some pools were deep. And I remember I was able to go back and forth, back and forth. And because I, there's this understanding, and here's what you have to understand. When you're learning how to swim, it is never about the shallow. It is to prepare you for the deep. It's never about the shallow. The shallow was what got you started. But it's to prepare you to go to the deep. The problem we have today is that we've stayed in the shallow too long and God's calling us to the deep. God's calling us to the deep truths of him. God's calling us to work our faith. God's calling us to come to him so that we don't stay stuck on what someone else said. So that we don't stay stuck on old habits. So that we don't stay stuck on the same thing. Because every time we stay in the shallow, all we're saying is, you know what? I like being safe, but safe doesn't always mean saved. Okay. It doesn't always mean that. Staying in the shower is great. Feels good. I can sit down. I can lounge around. I don't need those little floaties. If you're in the shallow and you're older and you got, there's something wrong with you, all right? Shallow is great. You can, if you're like me, man, if you're in the shallow, hey, that's cool. We can have a conversation, drink a nice cold Coke. We'll chill. But we were never meant to stay there. And Paul's trying to tell the people, hey, be careful that you don't stay in the shallow. Be careful that you don't stick to what is safe, that your faith begins to dwindle because there's so much more that God wants to offer you. There's so much more to know about God. There's so much more that God wants to show you. There's so much experiences that you haven't, ex that you haven't even seen yet because God has asked you to go forward. God has asked you to find out more about him. God has asked you to take necessary. That's why last week, the reason why I was so passionate last week, I wasn't upset about anything. I just needed everyone to understand that, man, there's so much more that we can do with the Holy Spirit. There's so much more that we can experience with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why me and you are drowning is because, man, we stayed in the shallow instead of preparing for the deep. Preparing for what's next. And that's why we drown. We go forward. We, we, don't, we, we, we never prepared. And life happened. Things happen. Empty, like Paul said, empty words, philosophies came. People that don't have a relationship with Jesus trying to get you to question him and think that he's not worth it. All these things came. And before you know it, you drown. God did not call us to stay in the shallow. There's so much more in the deep. Not only that, not only to float in the deep, but to survive, to live, to praise. There's just so much more in the deep. God wants you to find out what it is to have a deeper relationship with him. 
That's why Paul's using two metaphors. He's like, hey, your roots got to go down deep. It's not just some, you're not just some nice plant. You know, we're not meant to just wither. No, deep. When we're reading the word of God, we're we're not just reading it out of religion. We're, We're trying to know God in a deeper way. Because in the word of God, there is an answer for everything we face. In the word of God is where we find peace and restoration. In the word of God, we know how to battle and combat things that are happening to us. It's in the word of God where we find truth. And as we're accepting Jesus, that's the first step, but there's so much more. And so Paul's addressing the people in Colossians. He's like, hey, you got to go deeper. You can't stay satisfied with the shallow. That's great. You accomplished getting in the water. You accomplished sitting. You accomplished what it was to go a little bit back and forth. But hey, it's time to go forward. So that you don't get lost with shallow. Shallow people, shallow conversations, shallow teachings, shallow philosophies. You don't get stuck there. If we're going to go forward, we have to understand what we believe about God is the most important thing about us, what we believe about him. Because if I believe that my God is great, then it doesn't matter what's happening to me. I'm going to overcome it. If I believe that my God loves me, it doesn't matter what other people say. I know I'm loved. If I believe that God is for me, oh my gosh. It doesn't matter what people are saying. It doesn't matter my sins. God still has something for me. If I believe this, if I believe the truth of who God is, but we believe. Second thing is this. To go forward, we need to have a complete faith. We need to know what we believe and we need to have a complete faith. If you want to go with me, we're going to go back to 8, eight through 10. It says this, it says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body so that you are complete through your union with Christ who is head over every ruler and every authority. What I mean by this church is that My faith is not based on what someone said. It's based on what Jesus did. It's not about what someone said. My faith is built on what Jesus has already done. He completed that and therefore I am complete in him. Not lacking anything. We must be complete in our faith. That means we have to continue to stay connected to who Jesus is. Because in him... In him, we find completeness. In him, we don't have to, here's the thing. We don't have to get stuck anymore on empty words. We found everything we need in him. We found everything we needed in him. Don't get stuck on what other people said. Find what you need in him. If you're missing something, it's found in him. It's like a puzzle. God already completed the puzzle. He just needs you to stay connected. He needs you to stay stuck. There is no power or anything that can come against what God has already done in our life. And like I said earlier, the word of God has remained through generations. Being complete in him is not only that we are complete in him, but we're complete with him. We're complete with him. Let's go back to 12 through 13. It says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then he made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. We're not just complete in him, we're complete with him. We're complete with him. The Bible says we've been, we've been buried That means that me and you, when we gave our life to Jesus, we died to ourselves. The old me is dead. The hurt me, the broken me, the disturbed me, the sinful me, the me that didn't care about what God thought or I didn't care about what the word of God, that old me died. The Bible says that he raised us to life again. He says you have a new life in him. You've been raised 
Because we put our trust and our focus on the power of God and not men. That's why when we do baptisms, baptisms is a symbol of our new life in Jesus. When you go down in the water, that is representing that I am dying to myself. And when I come back up, that is a representation that I am a new person. I am raised to life. I'm letting the world know, hey, the old me, the old John is dead. I'm a new John. The old me, the people that, people that knew me back then, they're going to see a new me. Because Jesus was kind and loving enough to forgive me of my sins, to restore me. But Paul says, by his mighty power. By his mighty power. So the old me is dead. The new me has risen. Because we believed in God. We believed in what the power of God can do. We chose to trust him, even when everything else told us not to. We chose to give our lives to him, even if it wasn't so popular with other people. So we're complete. We're complete in him. We're co complete with him. And then we're complete through him. Hallelujah. We're complete through him. <laughs> Bible says we have forgiveness of sins. That means that we are dying, we have, we're progressing, we're dying daily to ourselves. God is constantly changing us. And then we have the freedom, the Bible says we have the freedom from the law. You know what that means? It means this, it says, I, it means this, I don't have to do anything to prove my worth to God. People were obsessed during that time to think that they had to do something to prove themselves to God so that God can love them. And God's like, you don't got to prove nothing, I already love you. Parents, you know this. Your kids don't have to prove anything to you. You love them. Do they make mistakes? Yes. Do they fall short? Of course. But at the end of the day, you love your kids. Am I correct, parents? How much more God meet for me and you? From a perspective of a father, that he sees us. And he's like, hey, you don't got to prove nothing to me. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're not some orphan. You belong to me. Hallelujah. I think that's, that's going to heal some people. You belong to him. Paul ends this by talking about us getting delivered by the power of God. We're delivered from the power of the devil. I carry that, which means this church, as I end this, is that we carry a power that allows us, we carry something that allows us to overcome every attack from the devil. We carry a power, the power of the Holy Spirit that when the devil wants to come to distract us and to discourage us, we fight back with the word of God. When our past wants to follow us, we have the ability to say no. We have the power to turn around and start fresh. That's what it is. We're complete in him. My name is Pastor Sam Velez. I'm the executive pastor here at Iglesia Cristiana Misericordia. God has a specific word for you. Open up your heart and get ready to receive. <laughs>